Welcome back to another edition of We Rise Fighting Labor Podcast. We bring you today's labor news, history, and analysis from the U.S. and around the world. This is a podcast you listen to with your fellow workers organizing on the shop floor. This is a podcast you listen to before walking into your union meeting. As always, I'm Rico Rutia, here with my co-host, Brian Pfeiffer. We cover a lot of ground in today's episode of We Rise Fighting. In today's episode, we talk about everything from Vladimir Lenin to an Oakland port being shut down in solidarity with the people of Gaza to the Teamsters struggle against Anheuser-Busch, a February 10th action in Madison, Wisconsin called Stop the Hate, Build People's Unity. Also, we talk about rent strikes today and in the 1930s, the Newton Teachers Strike in Massachusetts, and then we cover a bunch of headlines because a lot of stuff happened as far as labor news this week. We finalize the show with the words of Kwame Turi, but for right now, right now, we're going to give you a little bit of culture, a little bit of music. This band called The Minutemen. They are somewhere between punk and funk. Their bassist, Mike Watt, is one of my favorite bassists. And this song is called Fascist. It's an anti-fascist song. Don't preach your structure, society. Put in ideas of reality. Their words like freedom in common cause. Them words I hate war and all is lost. I can't follow a man on a white horse. Truth to control, well looked of course. Tyranny is the real word. Voices and opinions are never heard. We all work for the working mass. We all work for the ruling class. State relies on the working man. If there's a party and a fatherland. They all kneel to the party elite, all enslaved to the fascists. All right. Welcome back, everyone. This is episode number 70, Brian, 70 of We Rise Fighting Labor podcast. And That's right. on And on this very day, 100 years ago, Comrade Lenin passed away. And so we just wanted to tip our hats to Comrade Lenin to his contributions to the revolutionary struggle. What I love about the Russian Revolution is that it was the first revolution to come out and say, no slaves, no masters. And also just wanted to share a couple of my favorite Lenin quotes, one of which is, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. Uh, That one and also another one which is an excerpt from What is to be Done, one is one of his writings. <clears throat> and the excerpt goes as follows. In order that we may do this, the intellectuals must talk to us less of what we already know and tell us more about what we do not yet know and what we can never learn from our factory and quote-unquote economic experience, namely political knowledge. You intellectuals can acquire this knowledge, and it is your duty to bring it to us in a hundred and a thousand greater measure than you have done up until now. And you must bring it to us, not in the form of discussions, pamphlets, and articles, which very often, pardon our frankness, are rather dull, but precisely in the form of vivid exposures of what our government and our governing classes are doing at this very moment in all spheres of life. And it is exactly that, what we try to do on this podcast, bring out some exposures, let y'all know who the capitalists are, who the owners are, who the powers that be are. So that's what we try to do on this show in that spirit. And that's what episode number 70 is about. Uh, So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring you a little bit of news. Uh, I'm seeing some stuff happening in the port of Oakland. Brian, what's going on there? Yes, Rick, that spirit was definitely alive on January 13th at the port of Oakland. Thousands of people, including trade unionists, joined the protest at the Port of Oakland on January 13th to protest the U.S.-supported Israeli genocidal apartheid on the people of Gaza and the pogroms on the West Bank, as well as throughout entire historic Palestine. ILWU Local 10, whose members work at the port, also took a vote at their union meeting to protest the attacks on Gaza by Israel and said they would not cross picket lines at the port. 
The picket lines organized by AROC went up early in the morning at the port and the PMA port bosses decided as a result that no longshore workers would be requested to work the port on the 13th, including a contract military ship that carried military cargo to Israel in the past. Many more union developments related to Palestine within the U.S. and beyond are at laborforpalestine.net. This includes statements, resolutions, petitions, and more. Laborforpalestine.net. All right, Rick, back to you. Right on. And this week, you know, we told you we'd keep you up to date on the Teamster struggle at Anheuser-Busch. And so just trying to do that. This week, the Guardian newspaper reports, well, the headline reads as follows. There won't be any beer come March. U.S. Anheuser-Busch workers threaten strike. Okay, and again, this is from The Guardian, and it reads, represented by Teamsters, 5,000 workers at 12 breweries prepared to strike after voting 99% in favor. And that's a 99% strike authorization vote. And what that means is that the workers, the union, the union members, authorize the union leadership to call a strike. That's not an actual call to strike. I always like to make that clarification when we're talking about this stuff, because some folks don't know. Uh, the article reads as follows, and, and again, this is from The Guardian. Workers who make Bud Light and other top-selling beers are threatening to strike in demand of significant wage increases, job security, and improvements to retirement and benefits in the first big union contract battle of 2024. 5,000 workers represented by the Teamsters at 12 Anheuser-Busch breweries in the U.S. are threatening to strike after voting 99% in favor of a strike authorization last month. Their current union contract is set to expire on February 29th. Without a contract by February 29th, there won't be any beer come March, the Teamsters warned on X. The contract fight is the first at Anheuser-Busch with the Teamsters president, Sean O'Brien, at the helm of the union. Elected in 2022, O'Brien led the union in securing record contract gains at UPS last year amid threats of a massive strike. If Anheuser-Busch's executives can't get their act together to negotiate an agreement that respects workers, we will see them out in the streets, O'Brien said in a statement on the strike vote. According to the Teamsters, the union hasn't met with Anheuser-Busch since November 16th when the company refused to negotiate on job security. Antoinette Norris, who has worked at the Anheuser-Busch Brewery in Jacksonville, Florida, for 25 years, said workers were due for a substantial wage increase in the new contract as wages have lagged behind inflation and price increases. When I started, Anheuser-Busch was what you would consider the top dog. It was the job to have. The pay was great, but with inflation, we were not the top paying job, she said. Norris said her brother had started working at Anheuser-Busch in the last five years. Things that would have been easily attainable to me when I started are not that for me now, said Norris. With the increases of prices for everyone, people are working numerous amounts of overtime to try to make up for the pay we don't have this time around, unquote. Workers face intense heat during summer weather and intense cold during the winter, said Norris. They sacrifice time from families to work night shifts and handle dangerous high-tech equipment. It's a great product to enjoy out in the market, but it's a big sacrifice to make that product, Norris said. We want a fair and great contract that we feel that we are long overdue for. Anheuser-Busch brews some of the best-selling beer products in the U.S. market, including Budweiser products, Michelob Ultra, Bush, and Stella Ar- Stella Artois. A Stella Artois. However, you may, may pronounce that. Parent company AB InBev makes about a quarter of all the beer drunk globally and reported profits of over $32 billion in fiscal year 2023, a 1.97 increase from 2022. Angel Arroyo, who is 53 years old, has worked at Anheuser-Busch's brewery in Fort Collins, Colorado for over 20 years. He said that wages at the brewery had fallen behind compared with other businesses in the area. And this is a quote from Arroyo. 20 years ago, Anheuser-Busch was one of the top paying businesses here in Colorado. Unfortunately, with the concessions we made throughout the years, a two-tier in medical benefits and slight wage increase, we really let Anheuser InBev get a stronghold on the work we've accomplished, said Arroyo. We're looking for job security. We're looking for the American dream, he said. We need to share in our profits and we need to bring up the working class better than it was before. 
Arroyo said the 99% strike authorization vote sent the message that workers are sticking together to demand what's due to them. The last contract reached in 2019 included only $2.50 in wage increases over five years and included higher medical benefit costs for new employees. Quote, even our younger employees who aren't so well versed in unions are getting on board. They see what the future holds. They've seen their parents struggle, and I think they're realizing that that's not the life they want, said Arroyo. So we'll continue to keep you updated on the Teamster struggle with Enhauser Bush. Uh, up next, Brian uh, with Stop the Hate Rally and Build People's Unity. Yes, in Madison, February 10th, 2024, in just three, less than three short weeks, there will be a Stop the Hate, Build People's Unity rally in March in Madison, February 10th. Participants will gather at Library Mall on Spade Street at the University of Wisconsin Madison campus at 1 p.m. There will be a speak out by union members, students, and community members. A newly formed People's Unity Coalition, which is in formation, is sponsoring the event. The Wisconsin Bailout the People Movement and others are assisting this coalition in solidarity. More information will be forthcoming. Facebook event and flyers are available at the Wisconsin Bailout the People Movement Facebook page and at wibailoutpeople.org. And for a more lengthy description of the demands and why this event is happening, you can also go to that Facebook page. But for listeners to know that last summer in July, uh, a Nazi group called the Blood Tribe menaced an LGBTQ event at Watertown, Wisconsin. And this same racist anti-worker Nazis literally marched in Madison on November 18th this past year, 2023. And following that, there was a variety of incidents in Madison, including defacements of synagogues, also Arab and Muslim businesses and others. And this event here is to tell the entire community, workers, and also the Nazis and any other fascists that they will not march or try to march or attempt to march unopposed in our streets. We, the workers, built these streets. Madison, Wisconsin in particular is a worker and community and student center for well over 100 years, and we will not allow this to take place again without a fight. So Rick, uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions related to this. There's a variety of discussions when these type of incidents take place, and we here at We Rise Fighting have a position on how workers should respond to fascists like the Nazis, and also why they are such a violent and dangerous menace to our communities. So what's your response to this, Rick? You know, um, our own history, our own working class history of struggle has shown us that some of the most effective struggles against fascism and fascism have taken place in the streets. Um, you know, this idea that we're going to vote fascism out somehow, either through progressive or liberal political leaders, um, such as AOC or the squad or Bernie Sanders or anything like that, you know, that's, that's unrealistic. You know, the fascist menace uh, comes from everything from the state uh, to civil society there, there there's fascists within society there's 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 a civic arm to fascism so the thought that we can rid ourselves of this through the ballot box once a year during election day you know i think that's um that's just unrealistic so if anything yeah history has taught us that uh direct action uh direct anti-racist anti-fascist action is how to combat this menace and you know if we're not out in the streets ourselves if we're not out in the streets ourselves as say antifa is then we could we can support those comrades somehow but we can't let another situation like brian you remember several years ago when richard spence was on speaking tour right this white supremacist clean cut guy clean cut guy uh, white supremacist racist was going on this college campus tour and liberals in the states they were just like oh no 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 we got to give him the microphone you know for the sake of democracy because this is the marketplace of ideas everyone needs to be here no absolutely not you know fascism always boils down to genocide to the extermination elimination of an ethnic group of of a people and so, no, th actually, they can't have the same microphone 
If that's what you're rolling in with, no, you may absolutely not stand up here and advocate genocide from the microphone. So yes, we do disagree with the liberals there too. How dare you give the microphone to Richard Spence and let him go on, co on this college campus tour, on colleges, academia, you know, where supposedly intellectual thought blossoms. You're, br you're bringing Richard Spence into that? Well, I think I think that that opened up the floodgates to a lot more than liberals will ever take ownership of when they just let Richard Spence go on the speaking tour on college campuses. Get out of here. No. So anyway, Brian, long answer short, I think that the struggle against fascism takes place in the streets. Uh, it takes place in the workplaces. It takes place through direct action. I think that the idea of trying to combat it by, you know, we'll remember in November and voting fascism out of office, out of civil society somehow, I think that's unrealistic. And if anything, our own struggle as working class people and as a class here in the US and other parts of the world have shown that the anti-fascist struggle doesn't take place like that. So thanks for bringing that up and putting that out there, Brian. So All in terms right. specific, specifically of organized labor, Rick, just one last question for you. Why is it so important unions take up this issue to oppose uh, fascism, such as the Nazis or the Klan or other white supremacists in the street? Today, it was announced that uh, Ron DeSantis dropped out of the race and uh, for president. So it looks to be quite a year coming up. And just based on your personal and historical uh, reading, and your activity in the movement, what's your view of why unions are so critical to this struggle? You know, I think um, for a couple of reasons. I think right now we are in a time and place in society where class anger is out there. Class anger is in people's minds. You know, they can't, they don't make enough to pay rent, um, afford food, fuel, health care. Uh, rent keeps increasing. Uh, wages are stagnant. And so, People are carrying this class anger, and I think they're looking for answers. And I think that fascists roll in, and their answer is to say, yes, we acknowledge your class anger. It's the fault of the immigrant. It's the fault of the black worker. It's the fault of the queer worker. And when you boil that down, where does it end up other than the extermination of the immigrant? the extermination of another ethnic group, whatever scapegoat they may choose. And so I think that unions are there in part to serve as class education and let people know that no, 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 no. We are all in this together against a common enemy and our common oppressor is the capitalist ruling class. It's not the immigrant, it's not the black worker, it's not the queer worker, it's not the Asian worker. It's not, it's not our fellow workers. It's not anyone in the working class. It's the ruling class. And in this case, the capitalist ruling class. And I think, I think unions have to be extra clear about that these days because, Brian, as you and I have discussed on this show, unions are a microcosm of what a larger society can and should look like. A larger, more democratic society where workers can sort out production democratically, sort out the needs of society democratically. And we can't fall prey to answers like, you know, it's the fault of the immigrant or it's the fault of any other ethnic or oppressed group in the US or any country actually. So yeah, I think unions need to get on board with that. If we're gonna build a strong labor movement that is united, that carries a united front, then we have to look out for everyone in the labor movement, everyone in the workforce. And that includes immigrants, that includes brown people, black people, Asian people, African people, refugee people. All of them are workers and all of them need to be taken care of, you know? So I think right now at a time where class anger is understandably high. We can't fall prey to the rhetoric of these white nationalist fascist groups, you know, because they'll come in and they'll say, you know, hey, we understand your class anger. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There is an injustice. 
but their answer always boils down to the genocide of an ethnic group. So thank you for bringing that up and making it a discussion on this podcast, Brian. All right, listeners, we'll be there in Madison, February 10th, 1 o'clock, Library Mall. Join us, spread the word, let the world know that we're not going to allow fascists to march in the streets of Madison or anywhere else without a response. February 10th, 1 p.m., Library Mall at University of Wisconsin, Madison. More information at Wisconsin Bailout the People Movement. All right, Rick. All right. Now, here's another article coming from CNN.com. The headline reads, Another Hollywood Strike. Musician Musicians' unions are prepared to do whatever it needs for AI protections and streaming residuals. After a year in which both actors and writers hit the picket lines, another Hollywood strike may be on the horizon. The American Federation of Musicians, the AFM, a union representing musicians across the entertainment industry, will begin negotiations Monday on a new contract with the, with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, the AMPTP. The union said it is seeking a deal to bet, that better reflects the current state of streaming media. The AFM is also seeking AI protection, increased wages, healthcare improvements, improved working conditions, and residual payments for streaming content. According to the AFM, musicians who record on sound soundtracks make 75% less on streaming content due to residual income. Quote, the entertainment industry has fundamentally shifted, unquote, the union said in a news release, but musicians, quote, are not being compensated accordingly for streaming media, unquote. AFM's president and chief negotiator, Kino Gagliardi, told CNN the union is going to be prepared to do whatever it needs to get what we have to have in order to make the lives of musicians better. Our musicians have been facing pay cuts over the last year because of the change of the business model and how our product is distributed, Gagliardi said. We've got to fix that so that folks can continue to buy diapers, pay rent, pay mortgages, and have a decent wage with a decent retirement. See, that's what I'm talking about. Like yeah. class, economic issues, you know, that's on everyone's minds. That's why we report on this stuff because through this union struggle, this stuff gets teased out and we can talk about it on this show. All right, the article continues. The AFM says it has roughly 70,000 members in the United States and Canada. Members include instrumental musicians working in orchestras, bands, clubs, and theaters who create music for film, television, commercials, and other mediums. Music is what gives our favorite music and shows their soul, and these workers expect and deserve to be treated fairly in giving the contract that they've earned, Gagliardi said. We are going into these negotiations in good faith, and we hope that AMPTP is doing the same. That AFM will hold a news conference rally and musical performance early Monday in front of the AMPTP headquarters in the Los Angeles suburb of Sherman Oaks. We will continue to report on that. Certainly a struggle I'm feeling myself personally as a musician and, of course, labor union supporter. So we will continue to keep you updated on that. Uh, up next, I also have another article from the New York Times this time, and the headline reads, In San Francisco, tenants use labor tactics to challenge their landlords. Now get this. A small group of residents in San Francisco apartments are on rent strike. Can a union model work for residents the same way it does for laborers? All right. Auto workers in Detroit, actors and screenwriters in Hollywood, teachers in Portland, Oregon, during a wave of labor unrest over the past year in which more than 500,000 American workers went on strike, a small group of San Franciscans has brought a small vein of activism to a different arena, their homes. Tenants in 65 San Francisco households have been on rent strike, some for nearly eight months, withholding their monthly payments over a host of issues they say have made their living conditions difficult. A handful of red strikes have occurred before in New York City and Los Angeles. I wouldn't say it. Well, hold up. Yeah, full stop there, Brian, because you and I were talking before we recorded this. I would not say a handful. You know, you and I were talking about the 1930s in New York City, about the rent strikes that were taking place there. And even about, like, for instance, the Communist Party, right, which when people were getting evicted from their home, they would organize squads of people to come in, put their furniture back in their home, 
and get them living again, get them back in. And sometimes being beaten down by the police for doing this sort of thing. So this this isn't anything new, and this isn't you know just a few instances of it, it's not a handful of these that have taken place in New York City and Los Angeles. But anyway, let's carry on with the New York Times article. But activists with renewed fervor are now trying to organize tenants around the nation, saying that corporations, rather than mom and pop landlords, are increasingly buying up apartments and not taking care of the units. Uh, here's a quote. Many tenants these days don't know their landlords. They're nameless, faceless LLCs, said Tara Raguvier, director of the Home Guarantee Campaign, which is working to establish tenants unions such as the one in San Francisco. Naming and shaming doesn't work. Rent strikes will become an even more necessary tactic. San Francisco has one of the highest concentrations of renters in the nation, about two-thirds of households, similar to the share in New York City. As a result, the liberal politicians who lead the city have long considered renters a voting base they must woo. Though rents have fallen from pre-pandemic highs, San Francisco remains one of the most expensive cities in the country. In 2022, city leaders passed Union at Home, the first legislation of its kind in the country. It lays out a path for tenants to form their own association and requires landlords to bargain with them, just as an employer must meet with unionized workers. The law protects unions who, wants, who want to use common spaces for organizing activities or invite advocates to talk to residents about their rights. Within a year, tenants in 55 San Francisco buildings formed their own associations that called for a range of improvements, including quicker repairs, lower charges for utilities, and translations of materials for renters who do not speak English. Most of the associations have not initiated a strike. Tenant associations exist in other cities, but do not have the city-provided leverage to demand that their landlords bargain in good faith that San Francisco tenants have. In the Tenderloin neighborhood, where low-income immigrant families cluster because of relatively cheap rents, tenants have begun to organize. They live in one of the city's roughest areas full of older, worn apartments near open-air drug markets and homeless encampments. Luisa Rodriguez, 38 years old, immigrated to the United States from El Salvador in 2020 with two children, now eight and 18 and 9, and had a third child in San Francisco. The family lives in a small studio apartment on the sixth floor of their building and are charged $1,600 a month. This is a small studio apartment, $1,600 a month. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, who works as a cook, has not paid her landlord since June. Tenants on strike are paying their rent instead to a trust fund that is being held under their until their demands are met. You know, Brian, and that's the tactic, tactic that I understand, uh, that when renters go on strike, when tenants go on strike, um, you put all the rent money in a separate bank account to just let the landlord and anyone who needs to know that, yes, they have the rent, but they're on rent strike because you know, these demands exist because these conditions exist. And again, you know, I appreciate this article. That's why we cover it. And because we wanted to raise this issue as part of the arsenal of working class weapons that we can use against the ruling class. You know, rent strike is yet another effective tool that we can use against them. And I would encourage listeners to go back to the 1930s to check out those struggles that took place in New York City with the Communist Party against people who were being evicted, getting people uh, physically, getting their stuff, getting all their furniture, all their belongings back into their apartment. There's just something empowering about that. There's something inspiring. That there's something humane about that. So, yeah, we need to revisit that that history and keep that in our minds, support the people who are in this struggle right now. So I wanted to bring that up. Uh, up next, Brian with the AROC statement. Thanks for, before we get to that, uh, we've had many guests on the show here from Detroit that have been involved in these housing struggles. And our position here is an agreement with them that housing is a human right. Housing is a human right. Everybody has the right to safe and affordable housing, especially workers, of course. And 
We've had guests here from the Moratorium Now Coalition, which formed in 2007 in Detroit, and have employed many of the tactics that Rick listeners have has just described. And we'd also suggest going to the Moratorium Now Coalition website and Facebook page and checking out some of those tactics. And there's also a variety of them over the years, in particular, some of the centers in the 1930s, Harlem, Detroit, Milwaukee, uh, black workers in particular led many of these struggles and gave us many, many things to study and how we can apply this to the 21st century today. It's quite something. Some of these battles were pitched battles uh, in the streets, defending people's homes and, uh, and apartments. And it was in the midst of the Great Depression. It was in the 1930s when things were supposedly hopeless. People are actually fighting back. You know, it, it doesn't have to be hopeless and just the working class gets beaten down. No, things can be grim and working class people can still fight back. So yet another lesson that we get from this. So thanks, New York Times, for at least putting this out there. But we needed to add this historical dialect to it. Right. So it's similar to the Madison call on February 10th. Listeners, there has been a call by a network of working class fighters called the Anti-Fascist Organizing Committee or AFOC, A-F-O-C. And the full article about this call at fightingwords.net, that's fighting, F-I-G-H-T-I-N-G hyphen words dot N-E-T. And we're going to read the headline and just talk about a little bit of the glimpse of what this call is about. So this is a call to unions, unorganized workers, community organizations, social justice, and human rights group. Prepare now to defeat Trump's fascist plans. So the statement goes on to describe in background why it is so critical, of course, Trump's coup. And if that is attempted again, this statement uh, demands that or calls uh, for unions to uh, consider pushing resolution for general strikes if necessary, if Trump attempts a coup. Also reaching out to the U.S. military and the National Guard to disobey illegal or immoral orders. And it also very importantly calls for the formation of working class formations, such as anti-fascist squads, anti-fascist battalions, but also to build working class organizations. Unions, of course, for workers are the most important working class organization, but there are many that we can build. And as Rick just said, there are many examples in history. Philip Foner, the great historian, Howard Zinn, Uh, Robin D.G. Kelly, Mark Nason, many have written about uh, this over the course of the last 100 years in the United States in particular, but of course we can apply a lot of international situations to this, uh, especially in Central America and other places where working class organization has come to the fore in very heavy periods of repression to be successful in organizing. So this demand goes into some of that, and it also closes with organizing to confront Trump fascism is not an endorsement of the Democratic Party. The Democrats are steadily expanding military spending at the expense of the needs of foreign working people. The Democrats are arming and supporting the Israeli genocide against Palestinians and refusing to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. This should be of grave concern to all of us. But anti-fascist organizing means preparing to defend ourselves against direct threats to the minimal rights we still have to speak, organize, and take action for the working class. This is issued by the Anti-Fascist Organizing Committee AFOC. To endorse this call or for any other questions, you can go to all caps AFOC, that's AFOC, at peoplesmail.net. That's P-E-O-P-L-E-S hyphen mail, M-A-I-L dot N-E-T. All right, Rick, what do you have for us? All right. And to close off the show tonight, we're going to do a couple of things. There was so much labor news in the news today. I'll be real with you. I've already shared my process with listeners here on this show, you know, I'll go on Google News or yahoonews.com and I'll just type in union strike. And, you know, today and yesterday, so many articles popped up um, and we certainly can't cover them all without making this like a five, six hour episode. Uh, And that's certainly good, inspiring, hopeful news. So instead, this this episode, I'm just going to read some headlines let you know where I found the news. If it's something that really gets your attention, then uh, I'm going to encourage you to seek it out. But I'm just going to read the headlines here just to let you all know some of the stuff on the landscape of what's going on. Going to go a little deeper into this first one, though. Uh, The headline reads, Newton teachers remain on strike amid weakened negotiations. And this is coming from 
NBC Boston in Massachusetts. And the little bit of th that I did take out of the article goes as follows. Teachers in Newton, Massachusetts remained on strike Saturday night after negotiations failed to produce an agreement on a new contract. Schools were closed Friday after the Newton Teachers Association voted overwhelmingly the day before to start the strike. A judge issued an injunction. We talked about that last week. A judge issued an injunction Friday evening ordering teachers to end their strike by 3 p.m. Sunday and get teachers back to class Monday. But after nine hours of back and forth between the union and the school committee, a deal wasn't reached. So again, the headline on that one is Newton teachers remain on strike amid weekend negotiations. And that's in NBCBoston.com. Other la labor headlines that caught my attention that we can't go so deep into this week uh, include California State University announces tentative agreement with union ahead of strike, and that's in cbsnews.com. There was an opinion piece, Brian, you and I were talking about this a little earlier. There was an opinion piece in the LA Times that reads, opinion, I'm a CSU professor. I have serious doubts about the demands behind a threatened strike. Now, I'm not going to blast the person's name here. You, if, if you're really curious, you can go and check out this, this article in the LA Times. But, you know, Brian and I were just reflecting on this just in general. You know, just in general, why did this professor not put this before the union meeting? Why, is, why are these doubts and concerns being broadcasted in the pages of the LA Times? That's the part that didn't make sense to us. You know, if there's questions like this and the professor seems to have done some homework as far as number crunching and calculations and, you know, that how that may feed into the contract. But here, I think we're in agreement that the proper place for that is the union meeting. The proper place for that is speaking with your fellow union workers, because to put it in the pages of the L.A. Times, that's just... That's just fanning the flames of doubt and also giving a weapon to, in this case, the administration, you know, in other case, the bosses. But yeah, just wanted to highlight that and let y'all know that that article is out there. And just, you know, in general, I think we just need to be conscious of what we say about our own struggle. You know, even Brian and I, there's certain things that that we won't raise certain critiques that we won't public, publicly raise here on this show that we think are just better suited for uh, for the union meeting, for union members, for, you know, for the dialectic with fellow working class people, uh, not for, you know, wider broadcast in the mainstream media. So that's the main reason we were sharing that. So. That's the lesson that we wanted to share from that. Uh, more headlines. San Francisco mayor faces tough union talks ahead of November election. That's from the San Francisco Standard. Will San Francisco city workers strike this year? Unions rally to kick off tense labor talks. That's in the San Francisco Chronicle. Teachers Union in California call for five days strike. Uh, that's in San Jose, California. And that's from a Fox News affiliate, KYMA.com. California State University announces tentative agreement with union ahead of a strike in CBS News and Capulani Medical Center flying in hundreds of travel nurses as union nurses prepare to strike. And by travel nurses, they mean scabs. You know, anytime the boss brings in replacement workers to keep operations going during a strike, we call those scabs. We refer to those as scabs, you know. And what scabs do is they take the fight out of the union strike, out of the picket line. So that's why we are so staunchly against scabs and scabbing and use this show to hopefully uh, spread that consciousness uh, from workers who would ever consider scabbing. So those are the headlines. Those are little bits of news for today uh, as far as this week's labor news. Lots going on. You know, these happen to be smaller battles. Last year, we saw a handful of major battles, Kaiser Permanente, Teamsters, SAG-AFTRA. Uh, we saw some, uh, oh, also UAW, the uh, Starbucks workers. We saw larger struggles, but 
I guess today's headlines just showed us some of the more, some of the smaller, more localized struggles, which are still important and need our solidarity. Uh, so we wanted to keep you all informed on those. Tonight, we're going to leave you off with the words of Kwame Turi, uh, a revolutionary who has inspired me. I love hearing his, his speeches online. And in tonight's episode, we're going to share his thoughts on Zionists. So go ahead, kick back, and we're going to leave things off with that. Y'all have a good night. Thank you always for listening. Love and solidarity to all. That great man, V.I. Lenin, at the turn of the century, wrote a book entitled Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Is it imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism? Yes. If one would read this little pamphlet, one would see here that Mr. Lenin had precisely pointed out that all of the world had already been conquered and divided by colonial powers. There was no else in the world left to be conquered or divided by colonial powers. This is the time when Zionism comes to rise. Zionism comes to look for a state when everywhere else in the world is already dominated. Thus, in order for Mr. Herzl to get a country for Zionist, what he did was to attach himself to imperialism, British imperialism in this case, quite specifically. Of course, as an African who suffered under the heels of British imperialism, I can have no love for it, and certainly I cannot love anyone who attaches themselves to it and attaches themselves to it for the foundation of a state and then call this a liberation movement. Liberation movements fight against imperialism, not with it. Clearly here. Yes. The legal foundation of the state of Israel is what is known as the Balfour Declaration. This declaration was issued in 1917. A man in the government of Britain named Balfour wrote a paper and promised the Jews a national home. The national home he promised them was an area which Britain was colonizing, Palestine. Palestine didn't belong to the British. Just like Ireland doesn't belong to the British, even though they have troops there. But here, these British imperialists gave, signed a note and gave it to the Jews and they accepted it. Where is the morality for this? If you say that Israel belongs to you, then you don't go to a thief to get Israel, you go and take it. Once you go to an immoral, immoral being such as British imperialism, and this is the basis for you getting the land, then clearly here those who are truly liberation fighters must question this. The basis we say is the Balfour Declaration, and Zionists know it. The Zionism is certainly not a liberation movement, because it never fought against any imperialism. As a matter of fact, today, Zionism is the baby, child, and infant protector of imperialism in the Middle East. It carries out the interests of American imperialism. As a matter of fact, a Zionism and American imperialism is like this. If our tax dollars would stop giving money to Israel, the state would sink tomorrow. And certainly no one can deny that American imperialism is the leading imperialist nation in the world. So we cannot see how a liberation movement is so tied, string and ham to American imperialism. They work hand in hand with American imperialism. Thus they can hardly be a liberation movement. In addition to this, Zionism has nothing to do with anything religion, nothing. All religions are concerned with human beings after they die. That's what religions are for. Islam will tell you what happens to you when you die. As a matter of fact, this which forces you to live a good life so that after death you'll be able to enjoy the rewards of heaven. The same is true for Judaism. But Zionism says nothing about the individual after they're dead. They don't give a damn about you. The Zionism has nothing to do with religion at all. And one should not make the confusion here. The Palestinian state belongs to the Palestinian people. This is a fact.